The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter 8 Learn Something Useful. Every man should make his son or daughter learn some useful trade or profession, so that in these days of changing fortunes of being rich today and poor tomorrow, they may have something tangible to fall back upon. This provision might save many persons from misery who by some expected turn of fortune have lost all their means. End of chapter 8 Recording by Jill Preston Chapter 9 Let hope predominate, but be not too visionary. Many persons are always kept poor because they are too visionary. Every project looks to them like certain success, and therefore they keep changing from one business to another, always in hot water, always under the harrow. The plan of counting the chickens before they are hatched is an error of ancient date, but it does not seem to improve by age. End of chapter 9 the Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter 10. Do not scatter your powers. Engage in one kind of business only and stick to it faithfully until you succeed or until your experience shows that you should abandon it. A constant hammering on one nail will generally drive it home at last so that it can be clinched. When a man's undivided attention is centered on one object, his mind will constantly be suggesting improvements of value, which would escape him if his brain was occupied by a dozen different subjects at once. Many a fortune has slipped through a man's fingers because he was engaged in too many occupations at a time. There is good sense in the old caution against having too many irons in the fire at once. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Be Systematic. Men should be systematic in their business. A person who does business by rule, having a time and place for everything, doing his work promptly, will accomplish twice as much and with half the trouble of him who does it carelessly and slipshod. By introducing system into all your transactions, doing one thing at a time, always meeting appointments with punctuality, you find leisure for pastime and recreation, whereas the man who only half does one thing and then turns to something else, and half does that, will have his business at loose ends, and will never know when his day's work is done, for it never will be done. Of course, there is a limit to all these rules. We must try to preserve the happy medium, for there is such a thing as being too systematic. There are men and women, for instance, who put away things so carefully that they can never find them again. It is too much like the red tape formality at Washington and Mr. Dickens' circumlocation office, all theory and no result. When the Astor House was first started in New York City, it was undoubtedly the best hotel in the country. The proprietors had learned a great deal in Europe regarding hotels, and the landlords were proud of the rigid system which pervaded every department of their great establishment. When twelve o'clock at night had arrived and there were a number of guests around, one of the proprietors would say, Touch that bell, John, and in two minutes, sixty servants with a water bucket in each hand would present themselves in the hall. This, said the landlord, addressing his guests, is our fire bell. It will show you we are quite safe here. We do everything systematically. This was before the croton water was introduced into the city but they sometimes carried their system too far. On one occasion, when the hotel was thronged with guests, one of the waiters was suddenly indisposed, and although there were fifty waiters in the hotel, the landlord thought he must have his full complement or his system would be interfered with. Just before dinner time, he rushed downstairs and said, There must be another waiter. I am one waiter short. What can I do? He happened to see Boots, the Irishman. Pat said, he, wash your hands and face, take that white apron and come into the dining room in five minutes. Now, Pat, you must stand behind these two chairs and wait on the gentleman who
who will occupy them. Did you ever act as a waiter? I know all about it, sure, but I never did it. Like the Irish pilot, on one occasion, when the captain, thinking he was considerably out of his course, asked, Are you certain you understand what you are doing? Pat replied, Sure, and I knows every rock in the channel. That moment, bang, thumped the vessel against a rock. Ah, be jabbers. And that is one of them, continued the pilot, but to return to the dining room, Pat said the landlord, here we do everything systematically. You must first give the gentlemen each a plate of soup, and when they finish, then ask them what they will have next. Pat replied, ah, uh, ah, uh, I understand perfectly the virtues of Schistain. Very soon in came the guests. The plates of soup were placed before them. One of Pat's two gentlemen ate his soup. The other did not care for it. He said, Waiter, take this plate away and bring me some fish. Pat looked at the untasted plate of soup and remembering the instructions of the landlord in regard to system, replied, Not till you have eight your supper. Of course, that was carrying system entirely too far. End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 Read the Newspapers Always take a trustworthy newspaper and thus keep thoroughly posted in regard to the transactions of the world. He who is without a newspaper is cut off from his species. In these days of telegraphs and steam, Many important inventions and improvements in every branch of trade are being made, and he who don't consult the newspapers will soon find himself and his business left out in the cold. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13. Beware of outside operations. We sometimes see men who have obtained fortune suddenly become poor. In many cases, this arises from intemperance and often from gaming and other bad habits. Frequently it occurs because a man has been engaged in outside operations of some sort. When he gets rich in his legitimate business, he is told of a grand speculation where he can make a score of thousands. He is constantly flattered by his friends who tell him that he is born lucky, that everything he touches turns into gold. Now if he forgets that his economical habits, his restitute of conduct and a personal attention to a business which he understood caused his success in life, he will listen to the siren voices. He says, I will put in $20,000. I have been lucky, and my good luck will soon bring me back $60,000. A few days elapse, and it is discovered he must put in $10,000 more. Soon after, he is told, It is all right, but certain matters not foreseen require an advance of $20,000 more, which will bring him a rich harvest. But before the time comes around to realize, the bubble bursts. He loses all he is possessed of, and then he learns what he ought to have known at the first, that however successful a man may be in his own business, if he turns from that and engages ill a business, which he don't understand, he is like Samson, when shorn of his locks. His strength has departed, and he becomes like other men. If a man has plenty of money, he ought to invest something in everything that appears to promise success and that will probably benefit mankind. But let the sums thus invested be moderate in amount, and never let a man foolishly jeopardize a fortune that he has earned in a legitimate way by investing it in things in which he has had no experience. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14. Don't endorse without security. I hold that no man ought ever to endorse a note or become security for any man, be it his father or brother, to a greater extent than he can afford to lose and care nothing about without taking good security. Here is a man that is worth $20,000. He is doing a thriving manufacturing or mercantile trade. You are retired and living on your money. He comes to you and says, You are aware that I am worth $20,000 and don't owe a dollar. If I had $5,000 in cash, I could purchase a particular lot of goods and double my money in a couple of months. Will you endorse my note for that amount? You reflect that he is worth $20,000, and you incur 
no risk, by endorsing his note. You like to accommodate him, and you lend your name without taking the precaution of getting security. Shortly after, he shows you the note with your endorsement, cancelled, and tells you, probably truly, that he made the profit that he expected by the operation. You reflect that you have done a good action, and the thought makes you feel happy. By and by, the same thing occurs again, and you do it again. You have already fixed the impression in your mind that it is perfectly safe to endorse his notes without security. But the trouble is, this man is getting money too easily. He has only to take your note to the bank, get it discounted, and take the cash. He gets money for the time being without effort, without inconvenience to himself. Now mark the result. He sees a chance for speculation outside of his business. A temporary investment of only $10,000 is required. It is sure to come back before a note at the bank would be due. He places a note for that amount before you. You sign it almost mechanically, being firmly convinced that your friend is responsible and trustworthy. You endorse his notes as a matter of course. Unfortunately, the speculation does not come to a head quite as soon as was expected, and another $10,000 note must be discounted to take up the last one when due. Before this note matures, the speculation has proved an utter failure, and all the money is lost. Does the loser tell his friend, the endorser, that he has lost half of his fortune? Not at all. He don't even mention that he has speculated at all, but he has got excited. The spirit of speculation has seized him. He sees others making large sums in this way. We seldom hear of the losers. And, like other speculators, he looks for his money where he loses it. He tries again. Endorsing notes has become chronic with you and at every loss he gets your signature for whatever amount he wants. Finally, you discover your friend has lost all of his property and all of yours. You are overwhelmed with astonishment and grief, and you say, It is a hard thing. My friend here has ruined me. But you should add, I have also ruined him. If you had said in the first place, I will accommodate you, but I never endorse without taking ample security, he could not have gone beyond the length of his tether, and he would never have been tempted away from his legitimate business. It is a very dangerous thing, therefore, at any time, to let people get possession of money too easily. It tempts them to hazardous speculations, if nothing more. Solomon truly said, He that hadeth seritaship is sure. So with the young man starting in business, let him understand the value of money by earning it. When he does understand its value, then grease the wheels a little in helping him to start business. But remember, men who get money with too great facility cannot usually succeed. You must get the first dollars by hard knocks and at some sacrifice in order to appreciate the value of those dollars. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Advertise Your Business we all depend more or less upon the public for our support. We all trade with the public, lawyers, doctors, shoemakers, artists, blacksmiths, showmen, opera stagers, railroad presidents, and college professors. Those who deal with the public must be careful that their goods are valuable, that they are genuine, and will give satisfaction. When you get an article which you know is going to please your customers, and that when they have tried it, they will feel they have got their money's worth, then let the fact be known that you have got it. Be careful to advertise it in some shape or other, because it is evident that if a man has ever so good an article for sale, and nobody knows it, it will bring him no return. In a country like this, where nearly everybody reads, and where newspapers are issued and circulated in editions of 5,000 to 200,000, it would be very unwise if this channel was not taken advantage of to reach the public in advertising. A newspaper goes into the family and is read by wife and children, as well as the head of the home. Hence, hundreds and thousands of people may read your advertisement while you are attending to your routine business. Many perhaps read it while you are asleep. The whole philosophy of life is first sow, then reap. That is the way the farmer does. He plants his potatoes and corn and sows his grain and then goes about something else and the time comes when he reaps but he never reaps first and sows afterwards. 
This principle applies to all kinds of business, and to nothing more eminently than to advertising. If a man has a genuine article, there is no way in which he can reap more advantageously than by sowing to the public in this way. He must, of course, have a really good article, and one which will please his customers. Anything spurious will not succeed permanently, because the public is wiser than many imagine. Men and women are selfish, and we all prefer purchasing where we can get the most for our money, and we try to find out where we can most surely do so. You may advertise a spurious article, and induce many people to call and buy at once, but they will denounce you as an impostor and swindler, and your business will gradually die out and leave you poor. This is right. Few people can safely depend upon chance custom. You all need to have your customers return and purchase again. A man said to me, I have tried advertising. It did not succeed. Yet I have a good article. I replied, My friend, there may be exceptions to a general rule, but how do you advertise? I put it in a weekly newspaper three times and paid a dollar and a half for it, I replied. Sir, advertising is like learning. A little is a dangerous thing. A French writer says that the reader of a newspaper does not see the first mention of an ordinary advertisement. The second insertion he sees, but does not read. The third insertion he reads. The fourth insertion he looks at the price. The fifth insertion he speaks of it to his wife. The sixth insertion he is ready to purchase. And the seventh insertion he purchases. Your object in advertising is to make the public understand what you have got to sell. And if you have not the pluck to keep advertising until you have imparted that information, all the money you have spent is lost. You are like the fellow who told the gentleman, if he would give him ten cents, it would save him a dollar. How can I help you so much with so small a sum? asked the gentleman in surprise. I started out this morning, hiccuped the fellow, with the full determination to get drunk, and I have spent my only dollar to accomplish the object, and it has not quite done it. Ten cents worth more of whiskey would just do it, and in this manner I should save the dollar already expended. So a man who advertises at all must keep it up until the public knows who and what he is and what his business is, or else the money invested in advertising is lost. Some men have a peculiar genius for writing a striking advertisement, one that will arrest the attention of the reader at first sight. This fact, of course, gives the advertiser a great advantage. Sometimes a man makes himself popular by a unique sign or a curious display in his window. Recently I observed a swing sign extending over the sidewalk in front of a store on which was the inscription in plain letters. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 Don't Read the Other Side Of course I did, and so did everybody else, and I learned that the man had made all independence by first attracting the public to his business in that way, and then using his customers well afterwards. Jenin, the hatter, bought the first Jenny Lynn ticket at auction for $225 because he knew it would be a good advertisement for him. Who is the bidder? said the auctioneer as he knocked down that ticket at Castle Garden. Jenin, the hatter, was the response. Here were thousands of people from the Fifth Avenue and from distant cities and the highest stations in life. Who is Jenin the Hatter? They exclaimed. They had never heard of him before. The next morning, the newspapers and telegraph had circulated the facts from Maine to Texas, and from five to ten millions of people had read that the tickets sold at auction for Jenny Lynn's first concert amounted to about $20,000, and that a single ticket was sold at $225 to Jenin the Hatter. Men throughout the country involuntarily took off their hats to see if they had a Jenin hat on their heads. As a town in Iowa, it was found that in the crowd around the post office, there was one man who had a Jenin hat, and he showed it in triumph, although it was worn out and not worth two cents. Why, one man exclaimed, you have a real Jenin hat. What a lucky fellow you are. Another man said, Hang on to that hat. It will be a valuable heirloom in your family. Still, another man in the crowd, who seemed to envy the possessor of this good fortune, said, Come, give us all a chance. Put it up at auction. 
He did so, and it was sold as a keepsake for nine dollars and fifty cents. What was the consequence to Mr. Jannon? He sold ten thousand extra hats per annum the first six years. Nine-tenths of the purchasers bought of him, probably out of curiosity, and many of them, finding that he gave them an equivalent for their money, became his regular customers. This novel advertisement first struck their attention, and then, as he made a good article, they came again. Now I don't say that everybody should advertise as Mr. Jennon did, but I say if a man has got goods for sale and he don't advertise them in some way, the chances are that some day the sheriff will do it for him. Nor do I say that everybody must advertise in a newspaper or indeed use printer's ink at all. On the contrary, although that article is indispensable in the majority of cases, yet doctors and clergymen and sometimes lawyers and some others can more effectually reach the public in some other manner. But it is obvious they must be known in some way, else how could they be supported? End of Chapter 16 Chapter 17 Be Polite and Kind to Your Customers Politeness and civility are the best capital ever invested in business. Large stores, gilt signs, Flaming advertisements will all prove unavailing if you or your employees treat your patrons abruptly. The truth is, the more kind and liberal a man is, the more generous will be the patronage bestowed upon him. Like begets like. The man who gives the greatest amount of goods of a corresponding quality for the least sum, still reserving for himself a profit, will generally succeed best in the long run. This brings us to the golden rule. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them. And they will do better by you than if you always treated them as if you wanted to get the most you could out of them for the least return. Men who drive sharp bargains with their customers, acting as if they never expected to see them again, will not be mistaken. They will never see them again as customers. People don't like to pay and get kicked also. One of the ushers in my museum once told me he intended to whip a man who was in the lecture room as soon as he came out. What for? I inquired. Because he said I was no gentleman, replied the usher. Never mind, I replied. He pays for that, and you will not convince him you are a gentleman by whipping him. I cannot afford to lose a customer. If you whip him, he will never visit the museum again and he will induce friends to go with him to other places of amusement instead of this, and thus you see, I should be a serious loser. But he insulted me, muttered the usher. Exactly, I replied. And if he owned the museum, and you had paid him for the privilege of visiting it, and he had then insulted you, there might be some reason in your resenting it. But in this instance, he is the man who pays while we receive and you must, therefore, put up with his bad manners. My usher laughingly remarked that this was undoubtedly the true policy, but he added that he should not object to an increase of salary if he was expected to be abused in order to promote my interest. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18. Be Charitable. Of course men should be charitable, because it is a duty and a pleasure. But even as a matter of policy, if you possess no higher incentive, you will find that the liberal man will command patronage, while the sordid, uncharitable miser will be avoided. Solomon says, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Of course, the only true charity is that which is from the heart. The best kind of charity is to help those who are willing to help themselves. Promiscuous almsgiving, without inquiring into the worthiness of the applicant, is bad in every sense. But to search out and quietly assist those who are struggling for themselves is the kind that scattereth and yet increaseth. But don't fall into the idea that some person's practice of giving a prayer instead of a potato and a benediction instead of bread to the hungry. It is easier to make Christians with full stomachs than empty. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19. Don't blab. Some men have a foolish habit of telling their business secrets. If they make money, they like to tell their neighbors how it was done. 
Nothing is gained by this, and oftentimes much is lost. Say nothing about your profits, your hopes, your expectations, your intentions. And this should apply to letters as well as to conversation. Goethe makes Mephistophiles say, Never write a letter, nor destroy one. Businessmen must write letters, but they should be careful what they put in them. If you are losing money, be specially cautious and not tell of it, or you will lose your reputation. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20. Preserve Your Integrity. It is more precious than diamonds or rubies. The old miser said to his sons, Get money. Get it honestly if you can, but get money. This advice was not only atrociously wicked, but it was the very essence of stupidity. It was much as to say, if you find it difficult to obtain money honestly, you can easily get it dishonestly. Get it in that way, poor fool. Not to know that the most difficult thing in life is to make money dishonestly. Not to know that our prisons are full of men who attempted to follow this advice. Not to understand that no man can be dishonest without soon being found out, and that when his lack of principle is discovered, nearly every avenue to success is closed against him forever. The public very properly shun all whose integrity is doubted. No matter how polite and pleasant and accommodating a man may be, none of us dare to deal with him if we suspect false weights and measures. Strict honesty not only lies at the foundation of all success in life, financially, but in every other respect. Uncompromising integrity of character is invaluable. It secures to its possessor a peace and joy which cannot be attained without it, which no amount of money or houses and lands can purchase. A man who is known to be strictly honest may be ever so poor, but he has the purses of all the community at his disposal. For all know that if he promises to return what he borrows, he will never disappoint them. As a mere matter of selfishness, therefore, if a man has no higher motive for being honest, all will find that the maxim of Dr. Franklin can never fail to be true, that honesty is the best policy. To get rich is not always equivalent to being successful. There are many rich, poor men, while there are many others, honest and devout men and women, who have never possessed so much money as some rich person squander in a week, but who are nevertheless really richer and happier than any man can ever be, while he is a transgressor of the higher laws of his being. The inordinate love of money, no doubt, may be, and is the root of all evil. But money itself, when properly used, is not only a handy thing to have in the house, but affords the gratification of blessing our race, by enabling its possessor to enlarge the scope of human happiness and human influence. The desire for wealth is nearly universal, and none can say it is not laudable, provided the possessor of it accepts its responsibilities and uses it as a friend to humanity. The history of money-getting, which is commerce, is a history of civilization, and wherever trade has flourished most, there too have art and science produced the noblest fruits. In fact, as a general thing, money-getters are the benefactors of our race. To them, in a great measure, are we indebted for our institutions of learning and of art, our academies, colleges, and churches. It is no argument against the desire for, or the possession of wealth, to say that there are sometimes misers who hoard money only for the sake of hoarding, and who have had no higher aspiration than to grasp everything which comes within their reach. As we have sometimes hypocrites in religion and demagogues in politics, so there are occasionally misers among money-getters. These, however, are only exceptions to the general rule. But when in this country we find such a nuisance and stumbling block as a miser, we remember with gratitude that in America we have no laws of primogeniture, and that in the due course of nature the time will come when the hoarded dust will be scattered for the benefit of mankind. To all men and women, therefore, do I conscientiously say, make money honestly and not otherwise. For Shakespeare has truly said, he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. End of chapter 20. Recording by Jill Preston. End of 
The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum.